It really is a joy to be um, here with you um, today, to be uh, sharing this platform with my brother, with my brother Charles, um, to have been in the RTS orbit for 22 years, my first time in RTS Charlotte. So, um, so this is indeed a special blessing. I would be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge uh, some of my uh, mission to North America uh, co-laborers here in uh, in the room, uh, Alan Foster, who is our church planting resources director. And so, if you got church planting questions and stuff, you can talk to to Alan. Stephen Lutz is our um, church relations um, director. We got committee members, Brent Anderson here on our committee. Dean is on our committee. So, uh, and Charles is African American Ministries coordinator. So, praise the Lord. All right. So, listen. I. I am um, I'm over ambitious. I got many more slides than I have time uh, to uh, to cover in this first hour. But I'm going to give it a, uh, I'm going to give it a shot because I want this to be interactive. We're we're going to um, I'm going to be talking um, on this subject for this first part, uh, engaging the shift forward facing mission in an age of cultural upheaval. And I want to talk this morning uh, about the missional moment, the missional moment. What, what moment do we find ourselves in as it relates to the, the call to be on mission for, uh, for Christ? And, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit, and then we'll have some discussion at the table, and then come back, and I'll talk some more, and we'll have some more discussion. But i like to start this way with my own um, core conviction, my uh, a ministry core conviction, and this is literally uh, got shaped through my uh, my seminary studies at RTS DC, and this is my core conviction. At the minute, and this is really a definition of beautiful community, which is the title of the book. But but this is a, this is a definition that the ministry of reconciliation, as demonstrated in the local church by the gathering of peoples from diverse backgrounds, cultures and ethnicities is the natural outworking of a rich covenantal theological commitment. That as we see the unfolding of God's, the arc of God's story from Genesis to Revelation, that what we find is that Revelation 5 and 7, every tribe and tongue and people and nation, Revelation 21 and 22, that that's not God's plan B. That was God's intent from the very beginning. And that in Christ, the kingdom has broken in to today. And so God's people pursue that vision right now in very practical ways. And I'll tell you just briefly how I came to this core conviction out of my own, my own story. Uh, I was, um, as Dean said, I'm a native New Yorker from, uh, from Brooklyn and um, grew up in a Christian household, uh, ended up um, rejecting the faith uh, passively during my teen years and actively during my college years as an undergraduate up at City College of New York, where I was studying electrical engineering. City College is in Harlem. I became part of at what was at the time being called the Afrocentric movement, black nationalism. And as a part of that, I became um, one who was hostile to the Christian faith. I began to view it as the white man's religion, a tool used to oppress and enslave people of African descent here in the United States. And in God's kindness, as I like to say, he ultimately rejected my rejection of him and (laughs) and brought me to faith. And when that happened, I began to see all of this familial language that the Bible uses to describe God's people. This language, this seeming expectation that God is creating a new kind of we, a new kind of community under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and that it was um, it, it it was a community that specialized in reconciliation, specialized in supernatural love across lines of deep difference in Jesus' name. But I didn't see it worked out at all in the local church. And so this gave me, um, to use Dr. King's language, a divine dissatisfaction with the status of things. And I had to press forward 
into this, uh, this commitment. So I want to do two things. That's how I came to this, um, this core conviction. And I want to talk about two things here under this missional moment. One, that we are designed by God for beauty as reflections. That means we're image. We're designed for beauty as image. But we have devolved from our beauty as rebels. <laughs> we are broken and sinful. And so, so, so we're designed for beauty as reflections. And here's the starting point. God is beautiful community. God is beautiful community. God is in the very embodiment of absolute perfection of unity and diversity, diversity in unity. A quote from one of my favorite theologians, Herman Bovink, another benefit of going to RTS. Read a lot of Bovink. He says this, the glory of the confession of the Trinity consists above all in the fact that that unity, however absolute, does not exclude but includes diversity. God's being is not an abstract unity or concept, but a fullness of being, an infinite abundance of life whose diversity so far from diminishing the unity unfolds it to its fullest extent. extent. In God, too, he continues, there is unity in diversity, diversity in unity. Indeed, this order and this harmony is present in him absolutely. In the case of creatures, he says, we only see a faint analogy of it. Among us, unity exists only by attraction, by the will and the disposition of the will. It is a moral unity that is fragile and unstable. And when there's a more profound physical unity, I say, between the capacities of a single substance, there's no independence, and the unity swallows up the diversity. He says, you look at the creation, you look especially at humanity in its fallen condition, and what you see is unity by attraction. Who are my people? Who do I want to be with? He said, this is a moral unity that's fragile and unstable. Reform dog man, I had to show you the picture. <laughs> He says, continues, but in God, both are pr present. Absolute unity as well as absolute diversity is one self-same being sustained by three hypostases. This results in the most perfect kind of community, a community of the same beings. At the same time, it results in the most perfect diversity, a diversity of divine persons. This is our God. This is his nature. The Trinity, he continues, reveals God to us as the fullness of being, the true life, eternal beauty. So the beauty and glory of our triune God is seen in the mutual glorification of his communal life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we see this played out in the scriptures we see this played out in places like Jesus' baptism in the Gospels when he comes up from the water and the, sees the Spirit descending upon him as a dove and the Father's voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We hear it from the Apostle Peter in the first uh, chapter of his uh, first epistle when he speaks to those he calls elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He says, you're here, you're here according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Peter is writing to uh, Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. He's going to say things to them like, don't consider it strange that the fiery trial has come upon you to test you, but rejoice that insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings. He's going to encourage them to persevere in the faith, but that's not how he starts the letter. He starts the letter pointing them to the glory, wonder, and majesty of their triune God for them. Our God is beautiful community. And this 
has every implication for how we are called to live. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 26, I'm not going to read it all, um, uh, is my favorite chapter of the Westminster Confession. And this is of the communion of saints, of our uh, mutual obligation to one another in Jesus Christ. Westminster Divines in the 1640s said this, that all saints who are united to Jesus Christ, their head by his spirit and by faith, have fellowship with him in his graces, sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory, and being united to one another in love, they participate in each other's gifts and graces and are obligated to perform those public and private duties which lead to their mutual good, both inwardly and outwardly, it's the duty of professing saints to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God and in the performing of such other spiritual services as help them to edify one another. It's their duty to come to the aid uh, of one another in material things according to their various abilities and necessities. As God affords opportunity, they wrote, this, uh, uh, this communion is to be extended to all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Full stop. This is now, I know we're not all Presbyterians in here. Um, but I always ask the question in Presbyterian circles, um, when did Presbyterians say that this was not a faithful representation of what the scriptures teach? And the answer is never. Presbyterians have always said that this is a faithful representation of what the scriptures teach. And then we say, well, wait a second. How is it that we can have in the history of the Presbyterian church in the United States theologians who wrote in favor of racial segregation in the church? When they said the scriptures taught that all saints are obligated to come to the aid of one another in material things according to their various uh, capabilities. That they were obligated to perform uh, um, duties that, 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 uh, that, 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 that meant their mutual good inwardly and outwardly. And the only answer to the question is that those theologians and ministers were more committed to the spirit of the age than they were to the scriptures. And here's the thing, as Robert Lethem writes in his book on the Westminster Assembly, this communion is an overflow of the doctrine of the Trinity. That there is union and unity, but in diversity. Our communion is an overflow of the doctrine of the Trinity. William Perkins, one of the Westminster divines, wrote this in his notes about this chapter of of the Confession. We must here be admonished not to seek our own things, but to refer the labors of our callings to the common good. Lastly, considering we are all knit into one mystical spiritual, uh, mystical body, it is our duty to redress the faults of our brethren to, and to cover them, for love covers a multitude of sins. George Hendry, a theologian from a generation ago, in his commentary on the Westminster Confession, put, wrote this, about this chapter. He said, this love that the scriptures and the confession is calling us to is is one that's not based on mutual attraction, but it's a love that overcomes division and reconciles contraries and brings into communion those who have nothing in common save the fact that Christ gave himself for them. Remember, I just a few slides ago quoted from Herving Bobbing that said, among us, unity exists only by attraction, by the will and the disposition of the will. It's a moral unity that's fragile and unstable. And George Hendry helpfully tells us, in Christ, the union that we have is not based on mutual attraction. But it is a love that is a supernatural love that specializes in overcoming division. 
It specializes in reconciling those who are contrary to one another and brings them into such fellowship that you would say, wait, that don't make no sense. Why are they together? They're not, that, they're not supposed to be together in love and fellowship. But this is a supernatural love that the Spirit gives to his church. And this is what we are called. We are designed, we are designed by God for this community, for communion and community. So here's our, here's our question. We got a discussion question. Now I'm, I'm, I'm pitching the ball back to you at your tables. We're going to take a few minutes and talk about this question. How should our being designed for beautiful community inform our church planting efforts? How should our being designed for beautiful community inform our church planting efforts? So let me encourage you, if you're at a table like just two people or three people join with some other folks right we're going to take uh we're going to i'm I'm going to give you eight minutes we're going to give eight minutes i was going to give you 10 but i'm reclaiming my time we're going to give you eight minutes to to discuss this question amongst yourselves and then we'll come back and have some uh some interaction uh so all right we need to i'm going to press us forward Thank you all, because I want to talk about this reality, right, that uh, the other aspect of the missional moment is that we've been devolved from beauty as rebels. rebels. We've devolved from beautiful community. On the screen here is a picture of what's called a ziggurat mountain. This is from uh, ancient ruins from uh, Ur in about 2100 B.C., Uh, This image just gives you uh, a visual approaching what the Tower of Babel would have looked like described in Genesis chapter 11. There would have been a dome, there was a dome on top of it, but the millennia have worn it away. You can see in the stair, there's a staircase there in the middle and staircases on the, on the sides. Uh, This was uh, in, this was meant for worship. And uh, Genesis 11.1 1 is the last time humanity was one big, happy family. Uh, that is before Revelation. Um, and we were united in our sinful rebellion against God. God had reissued his command in Genesis 9, after the flood, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Genesis 11.1 1 says, now the whole earth had the same language and everyone spoke the same words. And they migrated east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. And, he, and we had a conversation with each other. We said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its height extending to the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed from here over the face of the whole earth. God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Our response was, no, thank you, God. We want your spot. And so the Lord comes down in judgment and in mercy to see the city and the tower. Uh, And he then, he says, Lord says, this is only the beginning of what they will be able to do. Lord is saying, if I let humanity continue completely united in their sinful rebellion against me, unhindered, there is no bottom to the depth with which they will sink. If this is what they do, using all of their architectural, engineering, creative faculties to try to transgress my throne, there's no bottom. So I'll fix it. I'll confuse their language. It says, right, they could no longer understand each other. They stopped building the city and the tower. And it says two times, Genesis 11, 8 and Genesis 11, 9. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the whole earth. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the whole earth. This is what I call the ghettoization of humanity. The, that, that from, that now my sense of what it means to be human 
What it means to be good and beautiful and right and true comes primarily or maybe solely from my people group. Who are my people, right? And when we see difference, we don't naturally say, "How? oh, let's, let's appreciate and value the facets of what it means to be the image of God that's true in that people group, in that culture, in that nation. We say, y'all are different. Y'all are strange. <laughs> y'all, I don't know, you know? And so, so, so there was... As a consequence of Babel, going to be not just person-to-person hostility, but nation-to-nation hostility. People group against people group. Oppression and injustice and enslavement as a result of this ghettoization. Indeed, right? This, This message was first delivered to the people of Israel as they were liberated from slavery in Egypt. Why were they in slavery in Egypt? Because they weren't Egyptian. That's what the text says. Exodus 1, rose a pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. He said, we got a problem with these Hebrews. They're not like us. (laughs) They're not like us. And so this is the origin of our discontent. Well, how do we understand that? In the current age. Because here's the deal. Division, polarization, hostilities, fractures between people groups is woven into the fabric of human history. It is not new to today. Just because we see political polarization in here in the U.S. of A., it is not new. But how do we understand, how do we define this age? And of course, notice the picture of the Brooklyn Bridge here, just to rep the city. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, (laughs) right? How should we understand the times? How should we understand the times? Um, In a recent Barner Research report on faith and Christianity, They reported that the U.S. is in a cultural crisis, gaping fissures between rich and poor, growing tensions between races, disunity among faith groups, increasing resentment between genders, and a vast and expanding gap between liberals and conservatives, generation, gender, socioeconomics, ethnicity, faith, and politics massively divide the American population. This splintering and polarization of American culture has made it more difficult than ever to have good conversation, especially about faith. Even when two people agree, honest interaction can seem elusive. Try to talk about things like gay marriage or anything remotely controversial with anyone you disagree with, and the temperature rises a few degrees But being friends across difference is hard, and cultivating good conversations is the rocky uphill climb that leads to peace in a conflict-ridden culture. In a conflict-ridden culture, Charles Taylor, and here's how I understand the age, uh, helped by him. He defines it simply as a secular age. He says, what I want to do is examine our society as secular in this way, in this sense, which I could perhaps encapsulate in this way. The change I want to define and trace is one which takes us from a society in which it was virtually impossible not to believe in God to one in which faith, even for the staunchest believer, is one human possibility among others, including possibly some very close including possibly some very close to me whose way of living I cannot in all honesty just dismiss as depraved or blind or unworthy who have no faith, at least not in God or in the transcendent. And here's, here's how we understand this age in many respects in the West in particular. A society in which faith for even the staunchest believer is just one human possibility among others. And we can't just say that those who have no faith are dismissed as depraved, blind, unworthy, immoral people. 
It says, belief in God is no longer axiomatic. There are alternatives. And this will also likely mean that at least in certain milieu, it may be hard to sustain one's faith. There'll be people who feel bound to give it up, even though they mourn its loss. This has been a recognizable experience in our societies, at least since the mid-19th century. There will be many others to whom faith never even seems an eligible possibility. There are certainly millions today of whom this is true. This is the reality of our age. Barna in 2021 did a study of a global, what they call a global teens study. They call this the open generation. 2021, they partnered with multiple organizations across the world to, uh, to interview almost 25,000 teens between the ages of 13 and 17 on their perspectives on Jesus, the Bible, and, and making, making a difference. And, and so this, um, this global research on the spirituality of teenagers shows that this rising generation is open and inclusive, seeking truth, authenticity, and change. They're open to different perspectives, different faiths, and different cultures. This is a picture of where these 25,000 um, teens were interviewed in all of these, these countries across the world. And here's what um, I want to share with you about their um, identification or what they, what they um, considered um, noteworthy about Jesus. When asked about Jesus, the, the, they gave them these options about these identities of Jesus. And the one that they were drawn to the most was Jesus the merciful. Jesus the merciful. Now, Jesus the marvel who did miracles was, was also popular. But note, note, Jesus the ruler Jesus the man and Jesus the outsider were in single digits. They had no interest in a Jesus who reigns as king over their lives. No interest um, in even a Jesus who was an outsider. Didn't find that appealing and attractive. It says, oh, they say overall, teens are drawn to the idea of a gentle Jesus who cares for and shows mercy to others, they are less inclined toward an image of Jesus that places him above or apart from humanity. Teens are attracted to a Christ who is among people and who shows them grace. And so um, this rising generation, uh, it, I didn't, I'm not going to share other aspects of it. You can see the study for yourself. They have a low view of Christians in the church even though I have a high view of Jesus. But they also have a view of Jesus in the past, but not one who has relevance for them today. Right? And this is including Christians and non-Christians. This study is not only non-Christian teens. These are Christian teens too. So, um, one other, and I know I'm, uh, what's my time? Give me, it's almost, I'm, what time am I supposed to stop? 10.05, so let me speed read and talk. All right, because I want to leave some time for, for, some, for some questions. I won't, I won't go through all of this. Here, th this is also around the current age, okay? The, 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 the missional moment. What is, so, so Chris Bell uh, published a book recently called Breaking the Social Media Prism, How to Make Our Platforms Less Polarizing. Chris Bell, is, uh, he's a sociologist at Duke University, uh, he runs uh, something called the Polarization Lab. And so he did a study on social media about pol our political polarization. And the, the idea was, wh well, what happens? You know, we talk about people being in echo chambers on social media. Well, what happens if, you know, we break the echo chamber, if we expose people on the right to different 
voices from the left so they get a different perspective. If we expose people on the, the left from, with voices from, from those on the right so that they get a different perspective and understand that there are different views on the same issue. I won't read all of this, but here's the deal. Here's what he found. He found exposing people in echo chambers to voices from the other side move them further in the direction they're already committed to. People on the right move further to the right when they're exposed to voices on the left. People on the left move further to the left when they're exposed to voices on the right. It didn't give them a different perspective. I'm not going to... Hold on. All right, I'm not going to read these two examples because I don't have time. But, uh, But Patty and Janet... Um, here's, here's what I want to point out. Um, unenthusiastic pa- partisans like Patty, Patty moved further to the left, do not carefully review new information about politics when they're exposed to opposing views on social media and adapt their views accordingly. Instead, here's the point, they experience stepping outside of their echo chamber as attack on their identity. That what has happened is our Political position is intertwined with our identity, our sense, uh, our sense of self. So, those who stepped out outside of their echo chambers were certainly not humanizing each other more effectively, much less criticizing extremists on their own side. Instead, stepping outside of their echo chambers seemed to sharpen the contrast between us and them. So, he says, the, the differences between us and them seem even bigger. For both types of people, either unenthusiastic partisans or people who are passionate partisans, for both types of people, stepping outside the echo chamber was not creating a better competition of ideas, but a vicious competition of identities. This is our current age. <laughs> This is the milieu in which we are trying to faithfully proclaim the good news of a Christ who's a reconciler. (laughs) The good news of a Christ who specializes in bringing people across lines of difference. In this secular age, people's identities are wrapped up in all other kinds of things other than being image of God. Their political partisanship their commitment to whatever their ghetto might be. All right, I'm on a, I got more, but I'm stopping there so that we can, do we have time for a few questions? Yeah, okay, all right. Sorry, short, uh, short stop. How do we, how we, do I just, we go five minutes. Okay, any thoughts, questions you have on, um, on stuff from um, this morning, by the way, what we were going to have was this discussion question. Uh, you can consider it later if you, uh, if you so choose, if it comes up on the screen.